preface of pope adrian the fourth an historical sketch this librivox recording is in the public domain all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales pope adrian the fourth an historical sketch by richard raby preface the following sketch was written to supply what its author felt persuaded could not fail to interest his fellow catholics in england namely some account of the only english pope who ever reigned in it he does not pretend to any novelty of research but simply to present a connected narrative of such events in the history of pope adrian the fourth as have hitherto lain broken and concealed in old chronicles or been slightly touched for the most part in an incidental way by modern writers in the course of his sketch the author has ventured to take part with pope adrian in some acts of his which it is commonly the mode to condemn should his opinions in so doing not be deemed sound he yet hopes that at least the spirit which inspired them in other words the spirit to promote the cause of practical rather than theoretical policy as also of public order and legitimate authority will deserve commendation for the rest the striking similarity between the difficulties which pius the ninth in our day has to contend with and those which pope adrian had to encounter in the twelfth century should only lend the more interest to his story r r munich may eighteen forty nine end of preface Chapter One of Pope Adrian the Fourth An Historical Sketch by Richard Robbie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One The information which has come down to us respecting the early life of the only Englishman who ever sat on the papal throne is so defective and scanty as easily to be comprised in a few paragraphs. Nicholas Breakspeare was born near St. Albans, most probably about the close of the eleventh century his father was a clergyman who became a monk in the monastery of that city while his son was yet a boy owing to extreme poverty nicholas could not pay for his education and was obliged to attend the school of the monks on charity this circumstance would seem to have put his father so painfully to the blush that he took an unnatural dislike to his son whom he shortly compelled by his threats and reproaches to flee the neighbourhood in a state of utter destitution thus cruelly cast on the world nicholas to settle the church in those remote countries where it had been planted about a hundred and fifty years the circumstances which led to this legation were as follows originally the three kingdoms of denmark sweden and norway were spiritually subject to the archbishop of hamburg whose province was then the most extensive in christendom in the year eleven o two denmark succeeded after much protracted agitation of the question in obtaining from pope pascal the second a metropolitan see of its own which was founded at lund and to whose authority sweden and norway were transferred the same feeling of national independence which had procured this boon for denmark was not long before it began to work in those kingdoms also and the more so as the danish supremacy was asserted over them with much greater rigour than had formerly been that of hamburg and was otherwise repugnant to them as emanating from a power with which they stood in far closer political relations and more constant rivalry than with germany after some indirect preliminary steps in the business which do not seem to have forwarded it the kings of sweden and norway sent ambassadors to pope eugenius the third to request for their states the same privilege which his predecessor had granted to denmark and which he himself had also extended to ireland in the erection of the four archbishoprics of that country the arrival of these ambassadors at rome happened a year before the elevation of the abbot of st rufus to the see of albano the pope promised to accede to their request it was in fulfilment of this promise that nicholas breakspeare was sent into the north 
doubtless the circumstance of his being an englishman had weight in his selection as in consequence of that circumstance he would be viewed as far more likely to possess a correct knowledge of the character and government peculiar to northern nations than an italian taking england in his way the cardinal legate passed thence into norway where he landed in june of the year above mentioned the country was then governed by three brothers named sigurd ing and eystein sons of the late king harald gilly between the first two a serious quarrel happened to rage for a norwegian nobleman having murdered the brother of sigurd's favourite concubine and then entered the service of ing the latter shielded his client against the punishment which sigurd sought to inflict before entering on the affairs of the church the cardinal legate saw that this quarrel must first be settled of the three brothers eng seemed to have stood the highest in the esteem of all classes in the state by reason of his benevolence and other virtues with him the cardinal took part and compelled sigurd together with eystein who seems also to have meddled in the dispute against eng to agree to a reconciliation at the same time he visited with ecclesiastical censures the former two for various crimes of which they had been guilty in other respects on the settlement of this quarrel he proceeded at once to the special business of his legation the erection of an archbishopric for the kingdom this he decided to fix at nidrosia or nidaros the capital of the province over which sigurd in those days ruled and corresponding to the city and district of drontheim now the selection of nidrosia was made chiefly out of honour to st olaf whose relics reposed in its church here he invested john bishop of stavangar with the pallium and subjected to his jurisdiction the sees of Apslo, bergen and stravangar those of the small norwegian colonies of the orcades hebrides and furrow isles and that of gard in greenland the shetland and western islands of scotland with the isle of man and a new bishopric which the cardinal founded at hammer in norway and in which he installed arnold at that time expelled the sea of gard were also included in the province of nidrosia the bishop of sodor and man as well as the bishops of the shetland and western isles had still this time been suffragans of the see of york but obeyed the authority of nidrosia for the next two hundred years after which the norwegian primate lost his rights over those islands which returned under their first jurisdiction the greater part of the other sees had already directly or indirectly acknowledged the authority of the bishops of nidrosia while the rest had bowed to the supremacy of hamburg the possession of a metropolitan see of their own spread such satisfaction among the people of norway that no mark of respect seemed too great for the immediate dispenser of the boon and under this feeling they allowed the cardinal legate to introduce various regulations into the country beyond what his powers entitled him to do and even to reform their civil institutions thus there is every reason to assume though positive historical evidence is wanting that he bound the norwegian church to the payment of peter's pence to the holy see he also effected extensive reforms as regards the celibacy of the clergy but in spite of his great influence does not seem to have been able to carry them so far as he could have wished various rites and ceremonies of religion into which abuses had crept were purged by him moreover he placed the public peace on a surer footing than it was before by means of a law which he procured to be passed forbidding all private persons to appear armed in the streets while to the king alone was reserved the right of a bodyguard of twelve men snorro relates that no foreigner ever came to norway who gained so much public honour and deference among the people as nicholas breakspeare on his departure he was loaded with presents and promised perpetual friendship to the country when he became pope he kept his promise and invariably treated all norwegians who visited rome during his reign with extraordinary attention he also sent into norway architects and other artists from england to build the cathedral and convent of the new see of hammer on his death the nation honoured his memory as that of a saint 
having finished the business of his legation to norway nicholas breakspear next passed into sweden his first proceeding in this kingdom was to hold a synod at lincoln to fix on a see for the new archbishopric about to be created but the members consisting of the heads of the clergy of sweden and gotland could not agree on the point as out of a spirit of provincial rivalry the one party claimed the honour for upsala and the other for skara finding that the dispute was too hot to be soon settled the cardinal legate consecrated st henry of upsala bishop of that city introduced various new regulations respecting the celibacy of the clergy and the payment of peter's pence to the pope and then took his departure for denmark on his way to rome the pallium which was destined for the new primate of sweden he deposited until the difficulties in the way of the election of that dignitary should be removed with eskel archbishop of lunt who received him in the most honourable and cordial manner notwithstanding that by his agency the authority of the danish church was so seriously curtailed the cardinal legate would seem to have sought by this act of confidence to soothe the soreness which eskel must naturally have felt at seeing his honours so shorn the primate of lund was also informed that he should still continue to preserve the title of a primate of sweden with the right of consecrating and investing with the pallium the future archbishops of that kingdom farther he was promised as some compensation for what he had lost the grant of a right from the holy see of annexing to his archiepiscopal dignity the style of legate nati apostolici sedis in the three kingdoms during the stay of nicholas breakspear in denmark it happened that john a younger son of schwerkes king of sweden and gotland and a prince whose radically bad character had been totally ruined by a neglected education carried off by violence and dishonoured the wife of his eldest brother charles together with her widowed sister princesses of unsullied fame and nearly related to sweno the third at that time king of denmark this atrocity naturally excited a deep resentment against its author at home and abroad and roused sueno to resolve on invading sweden and gotland with all his forces in revenge of so insulting an outrage a resolution in which he grew all the more fixed by the recollection that sverkes himself had formerly injured nicholas a predecessor of sueno on the throne by perfidiously seducing and marrying his intended bride an injury all the bitterer as nicholas never could retaliate it by reason of domestic broils with his own people the cardinal legate no sooner became aware of this gathering storm than he sought to avert its outbreak and repaired to king sueno to whom he remonstrated against the projected war not only on religious but prudential grounds depicting to him the many serious obstacles by sea and land which must be surmounted before any advantage could be won and reminding him that if the spider by disemboweling herself as least caught the fly she gave chase to yet the danes could only expect to run the certain peril of their lives in their proposed campaign the cardinal's interference in this instance in behalf of peace seems not to have been crowned with the same success as in norway king sueno a proud and obstinate man lent a respectful but callous ear to his arguments and was equally impervious to the efforts of the ambassadors whom swerkes also sent to prevent hostilities the events of the war which followed brought condign punishment to each party for prince john on being directed by his father to levy troops for the defence of the state was massacred in a popular riot as the odious cause of the public dangers and sueno on his invasion of sweden having been inveigled by the wily tactics of sverkes who feigned to retire before him to push his expedition beyond its original destination as far as finland was there surprised by a rising of the natives who destroyed the flower of his army while he himself escaped with difficulty into denmark covered with shame at so ignoble and fatal a defeat 
not long afterwards sweno was murdered in his bed by two of his chief nobles who had long cherished disloyal feelings towards their king and at last entered into a treasonable correspondence with Sverkes. the end of the latter proved eventually not less tragical in the meantime nicholas breakspeare had quitted the country and returned to rome on his arrival he found pope eugenius dead and succeeded by anastasius the fourth an old man of ninety anastasius who reigned little more than a year among other acts confirmed by a bull addressed to john archbishop of nidrosia all that the english legate had done in norway with the exception however of that concession to the primate of lund by which the latter was to enjoy the right of investing the new archbishops of norway and sweden with a pallium this right anastasius reserved to the holy see the venerable pontiff died shortly afterwards december second eleven fifty four on the following day the conclave met in st peter's church and elected the cardinal bishop of albano to the vacant throne in which he was solemnly installed on the morrow and took the name of adrian the fourth thus giving not the least striking among many examples in the dynasty of the popes of an exaltation from the meanest station in society to one of the sublimest in dignity and most awful in responsibility that exists under heaven End of chapter one Chapter Two of Pope Adrian the Fourth and Historical Sketch by Richard Rabe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two. At the moment Adrian the Fourth took his seat behind the helm of Peter's bark, the winds and waves raged furiously against her, nor ceased to do so during the whole time that he steered her course that time though short was yet long enough to prove him a skilful and fearless pilot as much so as the very foremost of his predecessors or successors who have acquired greater fame than he simply because a more protracted term of office enabled them to carry out to completer results than he could do designs in no wise loftier than adrian's and in so doing to unveil before the world more fully than was permitted to him characters not therefore nobler or more richly endowed than his the first difficulty with which the english pope had to grapple on his accession to power was the refractory spirit of the citizens of rome among whom arnold of brescia had some time before stirred up the republican mania arnold was a native of the city indicated by his surname and was born there most likely about the year eleven o five his was one of those proud and ambitious natures in which imagination and enthusiasm are mixed up in far greater proportions than judgment and sobriety from his childhood he developed shining parts and an ardour for study calculated to elicit their full force to pursue his studies with as little interruption as possible he adopted while yet a boy the clerical habit and not long afterwards obtained minor orders in those days events were passing at home and abroad well adapted to excite all that extravagance which was to be expected from a character like his in italy it was the era of the spread of those republican principles which were at last fought out so heroically and through such perils by the cities of lombardy against local barons and transalpine emperors in europe at large it was the era of the bloom of intellectual chivalry whose seat was paris whose foremost champion abelard but it was also the era of a widespread demoralization of the clergy among whom simony and concubinage were the order of the day and consequently every other disorder which naturally follows in the wake of those two capital vices in the midst of such a complicated state of things requiring so much steadiness of eye to view it properly so as not to be misled on the one hand by a false admiration and on the other by a false disgust 
the youth arnold devoured the pages of livy and imbibed from him as well as from other roman classics those principles of heathen republicanism which he subsequently sought to restore to practice in the metropolis of christendom with such fatal results to society and himself on the completion of his studies at home he repaired thirsting for deeper draughts of knowledge to paris and became one of the most devoted scholars of abelard whose rationalist invasions of the domain of theological doctrine by which the supreme authority of the church in matters of faith was threatened accorded with arnold's tone of mind in fact he soon arrived by the line of argument which the lessons of his master and his own feelings led him to adopt at the firm persuasion that he alone had hit upon the true plan for reforming not only the political but the religious abuses of the age and moreover that none but he could carry that plan out under this hallucination which the fumes of pagan principles of statesmanship and rationalist principles of christianity fermenting together had hatched in his brain he returned after a few years stay at paris to brescia not failing to visit at his passage of the alps the waldenses and other sects with whose tenets he secretly sympathized on his arrival at brescia he opened his career by a series of pulpit philippics against the temporal government of the prince bishop and the immoral lives of the clergy with fiery eloquence that told all the more by reason of the sanctity of the preacher's exterior a precaution which he took so well that even st bernard admitted its success arnold opposed the doctrines and practice of holy writ to the vices and luxuries which he denounced affirming that the corruption of the church was caused by her having overstepped the boundaries of her domain that she had done so was proved he said by the wealth and political power which she had acquired contrary to the spirit and example of apostolic times to whose simplicity she must return if she was to be reformed as she ought to be and as for the good of society it was indispensable she should be of course this line of argument received all that applause which it never fails to do whenever urged for the reformation of the church by reducing her to the poverty of the apostolic ages involves besides such purely spiritual advantages as are set forth at large in the plan others of a material kind which if not usually paraded with the first are not the less kept steadily in view for instance that those who carry out the reforms in question will be sure to get well paid for their pains seeing that the transaction necessarily passes so much money and goods through their fingers as well to private as public profit and then there is the secret satisfaction naturally felt above all by the rich and lax at seeing the clergy by means of this very reformation deprived of much formidable influence such as wealth always bestows on its possessors and which is surely as necessary to the church as to any other public corporation to the end that she may carry out efficiently the affairs of her vast mission keep up her dignity amid an irreverent world shield her oppressed relieve her poor members and strike respect into powerful sinners who would not only scorn but trample on her too if she had nothing but words to oppose to blows in consequence of arnold's sermons preached not only at brescia but also in other towns of lombardy and which besides their virulent censor of the existing abuses in church and state broached opinions contrary to orthodox faith especially in regard to infant baptism and the sacrament of the eucharist an insurrection broke out against the prince bishop manfred in the year eleven thirty eight and lasted through the next manfred made a vigorous stand to begin with then seemed on the point of giving way when an unexpected event turned the scales in his favour this was the calling by pope innocent the second in the year eleven thirty nine of all the bishops and abbots of the church to an ecumenical council at rome to condemn the memory of his late rival the antipope anacletus the second among the rest the bishop manfred and the abbots of brescia appeared and did not fail to seize the opportunity of denouncing the actions and opinions of arnold to the pope and the curia 
the proper course was forthwith taken the proceedings of so pernicious a disturber of the public peace were condemned himself warned to hold his tongue in future and banished out of italy under an oath not to return thither without an express papal permission arnold now betook himself again into france and smarting with wounded pride and ambition vindictively espoused the party of his old master abelard just then embroiled in his famous dispute with st bernard for the abbot of clairvaux had found out that it would never do to allow that honest but mistaken man to go on spreading his views any longer unopposed if the orthodox faith was to be preserved intact in christendom and so after more than once privately warning him of his errors to no purpose accepted a challenge which abelard at last vauntingly sent him to a public disputation this disputation came off at the synod of sens a d eleven forty and resulted in the total defeat of the philosopher by the monk but abelard appealed from the synod to the pope whereupon the synod suspended its farther measures and advised the holy see through st bernard of what had transpired in doing so the latter took care to expose the fatal consequences to revealed religion involved in abelard's opinions and in one of his letters on this subject stated the case thus that inasmuch as abelard is prepared to explain everything by means of reason he combats as well faith as reason for what is so contrary to reason as to wish to go beyond the limits of reason by means of reason and what more contrary to faith than to be unwilling to believe that which one is unable to reach by means of reason abelard fared no better at rome than at sens his defeat was ratified by that authority from which there is no appeal moreover he was commanded to desist from holding any more lectures and all persons who should obstinately maintain his errors were excommunicated foremost among these was arnold of brescia who scorned to imitate abelard's submission to the authority of the church and blamed his penitential retreat at cluny where he shortly died an edifying death st bernard who had previously formed an ill opinion of arnold from the reports which preceded him out of italy no sooner saw him at sens actively interested for abelard than he penetrated the entire duplicity of his character at the same time that he felt fully alive to the damage which the victory just won over error might yet suffer from a man so able and resolute wherefore as it was not his custom to serve the cause of truth by halves the saint resolved to include the scholar with the master in his denunciation to the pope who at his instance ordered that arnold too as well as abelard should be incarcerated in a convent but the crafty italian managed to elude his doom by a timely flight and after running many dangers by reason of the keen chase which st bernard gave him found a safe retreat at zurich in that age zurich by reason of the trade of germany and italy passing through it was the most flourishing town of switzerland trading communities are commonly as fond of novelty in opinion as in wares zurich verified this assertion in many ways for owing to its free government its proximity to the republics of lombardy and to the settlements of the waldenses in the alps the place swarmed with that motley tribe of political and religious dreamers which liberty is ever doomed to tolerate in her train of course arnold had his clique among the rest his reception by the citizens was enthusiastic a public situation was given to him and he resided in the city for the next six years during that interval he confined his activity to zurich and the cantons bordering it in these he propagated his doctrines with success and seems to have been forgotten by the public of france and italy no doubt he may be viewed as having helped to pave the way for zwingli in the sixteenth and strauss in the nineteenth both of whom like arnold spread the poison of their ideas from zurich in the meantime events were transpiring at rome which were destined to call arnold from his retreat and produce him again on the great stage of the world in a part more important than ever 
these were the attempts of the romans to restore their ancient republic on the ruins of the papal government these attempts were not peculiar to the twelfth century but had been made in preceding ages invariably to no other purpose than anarchy to the city and scandal to the world indeed there seems always to have been a party at rome whose adherents more pagan than christian in their hearts perversely mistook the destiny of the city and far from viewing its new spiritual empire as nobler than its old material one held the former as something meanly inferior to the latter wholly blind to the fact that the senate and emperors had been merely types of the hierarchy and the popes and that in these and not in those god had decreed from the time of romulus himself the true power and majesty of rome should eventually reside this party then who viewed the pope as the jews viewed our saviour whom they would not accept as their messiah but reviled him as an impostor because he possessed no worldly power this party it was that at the end of the eighth century treated leo the third with such impious cruelty in their first recorded attempt to overthrow the papal government that in the tenth century not only dethroned but imprisoned and murdered by the hands of the consul crescentius benedict the sixth and plunged the state into such disorders as to render necessary the bloody but just intervention of otto the third emperor of germany who delivered the holy see from the oppression and indignities which overwhelmed it about the middle of the twelfth century the example of the cities of lombardy roused to their struggle for freedom to a great degree by the eloquence of arnold of brescia again awoke the republican faction at rome where other elements of lawlessness unhappily existed in the papal schism which then raged and in which the anti-pope anacletus drove from the holy see innocent the second the lawful pope on the death of anacletus and the return of innocent the sentence of the council above mentioned against arnold of brescia still more embittered the revolutionary spirits of the city worked up to wild enthusiasm by the temporary presence of that arch demagogue on the spot to defend his cause at last the pope's conduct to the citizens of tivoli burst the storm of rebellion over his head during the late schism tivoli had sided with anacletus and on his death still refused to acknowledge innocent a roman army was accordingly marched out to reduce the place to obedience but was defeated by a sudden sally of the besieged a fresh army which was shortly raised behaved better and tivoli was reduced burning with shame at the disgraceful failure of their first attempt the romans clamoured for the total destruction of a hated rival and the dispersion of its inhabitants but the pope satisfied with the triumph of his authority would lend no countenance to so guilty a severity and concluded with his chastised children a fatherly peace for thus checking the bad passions of his subjects he incurred their displeasure whereupon the republican leaders perceiving their opportunity seized it at once and by their virulent denunciations to the mob of the pretended tyranny of priests soon stirred up an insurrection and got the citizens to hold a congress in the capital at which the papal government was declared at an end and the ancient republic restored innocent strove to counteract this revolution and called a senate at the lateran before which he protested against any right of the laity to interfere with his government much less to alter it but his efforts were vain and he took his ill fortune so much to heart that he sickened and died of grief celestine the second his successor had as papal legate in france formerly befriended arnold of brescia a circumstance that could not fail to make him popular and conduce to give effect to his efforts at conciliation so that he completely succeeded in allaying the revolutionary storm during his short reign which his death terminated in the spring of the following year under lucius the second who was next elected to the papal throne the public disorders burst forth again in an aggravated degree 
lucius deeply offended the romans by seeking to secure himself against their fickle loyalty in an alliance with roger the norman king of sicily in resentment of this proceeding the newly elected senate first caused the strongholds of the frangipani and of other adherents of the papal party within the city to be demolished and then sent an embassy to conrad the third of germany to invite him to come and assume the imperial crown under their auspices and act as countercheck to the king of sicily but conrad mistrusting the high-flown letter containing the invitation and feeling moreover little sympathy with rebels against the pope declined it hereupon lucius thought it the proper time to strike a blow towards recovering his authority to this end he marshalled his cardinals and other dignitaries in all their pomp put himself at their head and escorted by an armed array of lay partisans set out for rome with the intention of besieging the capital at first the people awed by so solemn and resolute an appearance of the supreme pontiff showed signs of not helping at least of not resisting his attempt but the agents of the senate actively at work among the crowd succeeded in dissipating this fatal apathy and in arousing in its stead so furious a spirit of hostility that the result announced itself in a sacrilegious shower of stones which rained cruelly on the heads of the priestly host wholly scattering it and hitting the pope himself on the temples who shortly died from the effects of the contusion this catastrophe happened january twenty fifth eleven forty five the next day the dispersed cardinals came together again in st caesarius church and set the thorny tiara on the head of a stranger to their order this was the abbot of the cistercian convent of st anastasius in rome formerly a monk under st bernard at clairvaux he took the name of eugenius the third he bore the reputation of a mild and conciliating man which fact would probably weigh all the more with the conclave under existing circumstances from the recollection of celestine the second whose gentleness had tamed what it appeared sternness could not subdue but eugenius now showed that he was not wanting in one set of qualities because it had hitherto served his purpose to display another for rather than recognize the new senate which the republican party wished to make him do he quitted the city overnight with all his suite went through the ceremony of his installation at the convent of forza and then retired to viterbo here he resided some months and vainly endeavored through st bernard's agency to induce the emperor comrade to arm in his behalf at last losing all patience at the lengths to which the romans encouraged by his absence had begun to carry things he levied at tivoli and other well-affected places recruits in his service took himself the command and marched to attack his rebellious subjects his expedition was crowned with success the republicans were humbled and sued for peace this was granted to them on the condition that for the future the pope should nominate the senators that his prefect should be restored and their patrician abolished eugenius then held his triumphant entry into rome amid demonstrations of enthusiastic loyalty and celebrated there the christmas of eleven forty five but it was not long before the clouds of disaffection gathered again as blackly as ever and discharged such a tempest on the refusal of eugenius to give up tivoli to the implacable hatred of the romans that he was forced to flee over the tiber amid a volley of darts and stones hurled after him by the mob such in fact were the straits to which the unfortunate pontiff was now reduced that he at length found it expedient to pass into france it was at this juncture a d eleven forty two that arnold de brescia received an invitation from the roman senate now wholly rid as it would seem of its great foe to visit the eternal city and lend his aid in completing as far as possible the restoration of the old republic 
such a golden opportunity of realizing the dearest dream of his ambition was irresistible he accepted the invitation at once and glowing with the thought of shortly reviving in his own person a roman tribune of the ancient stamp he crossed the alps at the head of a fanatical rabble of swiss whom under the hopes of sharing the glories of the expedition he had seduced to follow him as a guard amidst its peril at his passage through lombardy where his name was so popular new bands joined his march on reaching rome he and his men were received in triumph the citizens when they heard him in his speeches set off by quotations from livy and st paul style them curetes when they heard him give his florid descriptions of the greatness of the ancient republic and launch his thunders of denunciation at the disgrace of priestly rule set no bounds to their enthusiasm but forthwith invested the orator with dictatorial powers no sooner was this done than the indefatigable demagogue began his political reforms these comprised among the rest laws for restoring the equestrian rank and the tribunes of the people for more strictly excluding the pope from all part in the government and for reducing to the narrowest limits the prerogatives of the german emperors as the first step toward shaking off their yoke entirely at the end of three years pope eugenius returned to italy and addressed a letter from brescia in july eleven forty eight to the roman clergy warning them against proceedings of arnold whom he denounced as a schismatic and as the main tool of the arch enemy of mankind calling on them to desist from abetting rebellion and to return under the obedience of their lawful superior otherwise to incur excommunication but neither this letter of eugenius nor three successive attempts made by him in the course of the next four years at one time by negotiation at another by arms to enter his capital availed his purpose at last a fourth attempt towards the end of eleven fifty two by means of a treaty under which he agreed to acknowledge the power of the senate succeeded nevertheless he did not cease to suffer during the short remainder of his reign bitter mortifications from the insolence of the senate and the dictator arnold of brescia who continued to reside in rome in all his greatness and shortly before the pontiff's death in eleven fifty three aware of his repugnance to the republic and alarmed at his growing favour with the people defied him openly by increasing the number of the senators from fifty to a hundred and by giving them as presidents two consuls after the ancient plan instead of the patrician till then in use it was for eugenius third that his old preceptor st bernard composed at his disciple's request his famous book de considerazione in which the subject handled is on the duties of a pope and in which is given such a graphic description of the degenerate character of the romans as also of the roman clergy in that age the following extract will not be out of place here what is so well known to the world as the license and pride of the romans they are a people opposed to peace and ever given to sedition wild and hard to deal with from all time who only know how to obey when they can no longer resist who possess understanding only that they may do evil by it not to do good detested by heaven and earth they have impiously outraged both they are criminals before god profaners of his sanctuary rebels against themselves enviers of their neighbours monsters toward those who do not belong to them they love no one and are beloved by no one they strive after the show of being feared by all while in fact they themselves fear everybody they cannot endure any submission but yet know not how to rule they are false to their superiors and oppress their subjects they are shameless in their demands and reject petitions with the haughty front with blustering and impatience they press for presents and are thankless when they have received them they are great talkers with the tongue but helpless creatures when it comes to act 
they are spendthrifts in promises niggards in the performance the most crawling sycophants and the most venomous slanderers who feign the most honest simplicity and are the most malicious of deceivers End of chapter two chapter three of pope adrian the fourth an historical sketch by richard raby this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three such were the depraved spirits and such the ignoble tyranny which oppressed the holy see on the demise of eugenius the third an oppression which if its violence seemed to slumber during the short career of anastasius the fourth whose patriarchal age and paternal goodness to the poor in a famine which desolated the country under his pontificate commanded respect and won all hearts yet woke up again with fresh vigour on the accession of his successor the english pope adrian the fourth adrian however was as well by nature as by the experience of his past life a character not likely to be daunted by the threatening prospect before him and behaved with such courage and decision as for the time to confound his rebellious subjects and reduce them to obedience for when on his assumption of the tiara the senate which by this time seems to have arrived at the last pitch of insolence under the training of arnold of brescia made a formal proposition to the new pope to renounce once for all his right to the government of the state he no sooner heard it than he sternly rejected it and drove the deputation through whom it came with ignominy out of his presence hereupon the mob worked upon by the orators and other agents of the republic flew to arms and led by arnold of brescia himself who had been fetched out of the country on purpose gave in to every disorder and among other excesses murdered cardinal gerard a well-known adherent of the pope as he was passing along the via sacra to an audience adrian declared this atrocity tatamont to high treason and at once resolved to punish it by striking a blow such as till his time had not been struck at rome at all this was to lay the city under an interdict no calamity in the middle ages was more dreaded more cruelly felt by society than an interdict this naturally arose out of that profound religious faith which in those times pervaded all classes of men alike in the midst of the greatest crimes and disorders the interdict which pope adrian thus fulminated against rome lasted from palm sunday till monday thursday it will not be uninteresting here to briefly describe an interdict it was usually announced at midnight by the funeral toll of the church bells whereupon the entire clergy might presently be seen issuing forth in silent procession by torchlight to put up a last prayer of deprecation before the altars for the guilty community then the consecrated bread that remained over was burnt the crucifixes and other sacred images were veiled up the relics of the saints carried down into the crypts every memento of holy cheerfulness and peace was withdrawn from view lastly a papal legate ascended the steps of the high altar arrayed in penitential vestment and formally proclaimed the interdict from that moment divine service ceased in all the churches their doors were locked up and only in the bare porch might the priest dressed in mourning exhort his flock to repentance rites in their nature joyful which could not be dispensed with were invested in sorrowful attributes so that baptism could only be administered in secret and marriage celebrated before a tomb instead of an altar the administration of confession and communion was forbidden to the dying man alone might the viaticum which the priest had first consecrated in the gloom and solitude of the morning dawn be given but extreme unction and burial in holy ground were denied him moreover the interdict as may naturally be supposed seriously affected the worldly as well as religious cares of society so that trade suffered and even the proprieties of men's personal appearance fell into neglect 
at first the romans seemed as if they would not flinch under the novel and terrible blow dealt at them but this was a passing bravado they soon began to feel uneasy and then horrified at the sensation of the divine offices and the refusal of the sacraments in holy week a season of all others when the most lukewarm piety bestirs itself the consequence was that they assembled tumultuously before the capitol where the senate was sitting and demanded that measures should directly be taken to bring about such an arrangement with the pope as would relieve the city from the interdict negotiations were accordingly entered upon by that body with adrian at viterbo whither he had retired to await the issue of events to the overtures made he answered that he was ready to come into them provided the senate would first banish arnold of brescia out of rome abolish the republic and together with the citizens return to their duty after some hesitation and some attempts to procure a modification of such sweeping terms attempts which the inflexibility of the pope entirely frustrated those terms were accepted on their completion adrian revoked the interdict held his triumphant entry into rome and celebrated in the church of st john lateran with great pomp and jubilee his coronation in the meantime frederick barbarossa who had succeeded his uncle conrad the third on the german throne two years before and had lately undertaken his first expedition into italy to restore his fallen power in that country and suppress its newly roused spirit of freedom was advancing flushed with his conquest of tortona and his coronation as king of lombardy at pavia with his army towards rome where he proposed to give the last finish to his brilliant successes by receiving the crown of empire from the pope frederick and adrian had both sent forward ambassadors to each other who crossed on the road without knowing it the king to treat about the imperial crown the pope to sound the intention of a visitor who was approaching in such warlike array the papal envoys encountered frederick at st carico in tuscany and on being told that he meant nothing hostile to the rights of the church but on the contrary that he was ready to act as her champion and therefore came simply to ask the imperial crown they promised the pope's acquiescence in his views provided among other services required of him he would procure the delivery of arnold of brescia into the hands of justice this was all the more insisted upon as that indefatigable demagogue having after his banishment obtained the protection of certain counts of the campagna still continued to exercise from his place of refuge the most pernicious influence over the popular mind in rome frederick readily undertook to do a service which agreed as well with his personal feeling as with his policy for arnold of brescia on the election of the duke of Swabia to the german throne had written him a letter inviting him to come and receive the imperial crown from the senate in contempt of the pope but couched in such arrogant and fanatical terms as highly to incense the king who refused to listen to it whereupon arnold aggravated his offence by announcing that he would persuade the romans to choose an emperor of their own and throw up their allegiance to foreign ones the plan which frederick took to seize arnold was first of all to send a body of troops to waylay and capture one of the chiefs of the lawless counts of the campagna who had been mainly instrumental in liberating the arch-republican out of the hands of the papal officers into which he had shortly fallen before at auriculum and then to threaten the speedy execution of the prisoner unless arnold were given up as a ransom this plan succeeded the other companion counts frightened at the resolute conduct of frederick and trembling at the consequences of his further anger if the ransom demanded were not given soon brought their client whose revolutionary doctrines so much promoted those disorders by which they thrived to the feet of the king and received back their brother in exchange arnold was forthwith remanded in chains to rome there to await the arrival of frederick who intended to have the culprit tried before his own tribunal 
but peter the prefect of rome and commandant of the castle of st angelo a devoted servant of the pope into whose custody arnold was delivered fearful lest his prisoner should escape by means of a popular riot as he had done once before in the same circumstances resolved to execute him on his own account and without waiting for further instructions either from frederick or adrian but secretly abetted by several cardinals on the spot had the unhappy man led out early on the morning of the eighteenth of june eleven fifty five before the popular or people's gate where he was fastened to a cross projecting from the midst of a pile of faggots which being fired soon enveloped their victim in the flames his cries and the tumult of the execution roused the citizens dwelling hard by from their beds who presently ran up lamenting and furious to the rescue but in vain as they were thrust back on all sides by the soldiers who kept the ground nevertheless such was the infatuated reverence which the people manifested for their late tribune that it was found expedient after his execution to throw his ashes into the tiber to prevent them being enshrined as holy relics arnold of brescia was about fifty years old when he thus met his fate however shocking such cruel execution as he suffered may be to the more enlightened benevolence or more sensual refinement of the present day yet from the point of view of the middle ages that the visible punishment of a crime should be commensurate with and as it were symbolize its moral enormity there can be no doubt but that in the present case the criminal received only what he deserved few men ever did worse mischief to society in their day than arnold of brescia private ambition was his ruling passion and his hopes of gratifying it were set on the realization of dreams and fancies engendered of an unbridled imagination which an admixture of mysticism further distempered a false scandal which he took at the discrepancy between the lives and doctrines of the clergy in his time widely corrupted heightened by his pharisaical pride which a bodily temperament naturally disinclined to sensual excess inflated all the more as by means of such bodily temperament he was enabled with so little merit of his own to keep up an exterior severity of demeanour closely resembling a holy asceticism led him at last to confound the abuse of religion with religion itself and under the further influence of his insatiable thirst for notoriety to broach schismatical views and then a plan of ecclesiastical as well as political reform for the world of which he persuaded himself he was marked out to be the apostle that reform as we have seen was simply the return of society politically under the republican institutions of pagan rome and spiritually under the religious government of the apostolic ages a fanatic of this description endowed in an extraordinary manner with eloquence to announce his views and with boldness and energy to pursue the career of carrying them out as was arnold of brescia's case may well be imagined to have seduced the multitude at all times giddy but in his day oppressed and shocked by many gross abuses in the way he did and so to have elicited the stern hostility of the constituted authorities in church and state who naturally perceiving in the progress of such a man only confusion worse confounded and ruin to the temporal and eternal interests of society were in duty bound to eradicate the evil before it was too late and in doing so not to shun harsh means where gentle ones failed but if words proved fruitless to use the sword the obstinacy the infatuated obstinacy of arnold of brescia in the face of so many warnings as from time to time were given to him plainly proved that he was incorrigible and that therefore as it was no more possible for society to prosper as it should do while he continued to infect it with his wild theories than for the bodily health to nourish while eaten into by a cancer to extirpate him like it was the only course left 
a course which thus became morally as much a duty in his case as it would physically become so in that end of chapter three chapter four of pope adrian the fourth an historical sketch by richard raby this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four in the meantime much had still to be negotiated between frederick and adrian before the latter felt satisfied to confer on the former the imperial crown adrian was too well acquainted with the character of barbarossa not to feel it a paramount duty to require every guarantee before adding to the power and greatness of a man who like him thirsted for universal sway under which not only the state but the church also should bend and who in pursuit of his object allowed no barrier which he could throw down by fair means or by foul to stand against him thus it was that although in his present transactions with the pope he made plenty of fair promises he yet would not pledge his word to them lest by doing so he should commit his plans of future ambition plans which though he felt he should not hesitate to save if driven to it at the cost of his honour he yet would prefer to forward if possible without so mortifying an alternative but when after all his pains he found out that the pope was not to be drawn off his guard and that the transcendent stake at issue was not to be won except by confirming his word with an oath he submitted to take it and so swore on the gospels and on the cross before his own and the papal ambassadors in his camp near viterbo that he would neither injure the pope nor his cardinals but would protect their persons and rights against all aggression hereupon adrian felt confidence enough to leave nepe and repair to meet frederick at sutri to which spot the latter had in the meantime advanced his camp as adrian drew near he was encountered by a splendid deputation of german princes and bishops who conducted him to the royal tent as soon as the pope appeared before it frederick who was waiting to receive him courteously advanced to assist his holiness in dismounting from his horse but did not offer to render the ancient homage usual on such an occasion of holding the pope's stirrup in vain did adrian keep his seat in expectation that this homage would be paid the king persisted in avoiding what his pride could not brook terrified at such a bad omen the cardinals of the papal suite took to flight and sought safety in the neighbouring fortress of castellano leaving their lord to confront alone the danger which seemed to threaten him but adrian retained his courage and coolness intact alighting from his horse he quietly sat down in the episcopal chair which had been prepared for him and suffered frederick to approach and kiss his feet but when the king rose up to receive the papal kiss of peace in return adrian refused it and told him that he would not give it until the homage due from the temporal to the spiritual power had been paid in full as frederick denied in vindication of his behaviour the authenticity of the homage in question a hot controversy ensued between the parties at issue in which the king turned a deaf ear to every argument and example that was adduced to prove his error seeking to evade their force now by sophistical now by threatening representations until the pope disgusted at his disingenuous conduct and tired out with a dispute which had lasted over the next day to no purpose cut it short by abruptly quitting the camp hereupon the king perceiving that he must again offer sacrifice to his policy suffered the prelates who surrounded him until this critical moment had so vainly sought to convince him of the justice of the pope's cause to overrule him and then set out for nepe whither adrian had returned on his arrival he no sooner beheld adrian coming forth to meet him than advancing reverently on foot he held the pontiff's stirrup who on touching the ground directly enfolded the king in his arms amid the cheers of the spectators of both parties all these proceedings and the latter one in particular have been held up by many writers as setting in the strongest light the arrogance and tyranny of the church in the middle ages 
from our point of view at this day for estimating the relative importance of church and state no doubt the result of the dispute between adrian and frederick was wrong because it ought to have proved diametrically the reverse to be right in the twelfth century however the profound conviction of christendom was this that the pope literally represented on earth in the character of vicar or vice-regent our saviour in heaven and as it may be taken for granted that were the redeemer to reappear among men now as he appeared eighteen hundred years ago the proudest monarch of christendom in the nineteenth century persuaded of the fact would whether catholic or protestant certainly not hesitate to show this honour to our divine lord on receiving his visit so the sovereigns of the middle ages did actually deem it right and honourable to pay that homage to christ in the person of the pope in whom they acknowledged from the bottom of their souls our lord's regent on earth and as such their immeasurable superior in requiring frederick barbarossa to pay him the typical homage of holding his stirrup adrian did plainly nothing but what was entirely in accordance with the spirit of the age and at the same time with traditional usage as then received by christian princes but frederick did do what was contrary to both in his refusal and that too while professing to be imbued with the very faith out of which the homage in question sprang thus it is no wonder that adrian should view such an inconsistency as most inauspicious for the liberties of the church with which those of society were then so closely bound up and should therefore feel it imperative to pursue a line of conduct which at first glance may appear so arrogantly exacting but which found on closer examination to have involved the assertion of the most sacred interests against a man who was known to respect none in promotion of his ends assumes a character calculated rather to conciliate our approval than to confirm our censure as soon as the friendly relations between the pope and the king had been thus restored they set out for rome to celebrate the coronation in the meantime the senate though deeply offended at not having been consulted on so momentous an affair sent forward an embassy to congratulate frederick as he drew near thus it did in fulsome and arrogant terms informing him moreover that the queen of the world as the city was styled by the orator felt graciously disposed to confer on him of her own good pleasure the diadem of empire if he on his part would promise to abolish the papal government restore the ancient republic and make a present of five thousand silver crowns to the officers of the state but frederick no sooner perceived this drift of the speech whose tone from the beginning had greatly irritated him than he cut it short by an outburst of indignant sarcasm on men who sunk to the lowest pitch of national degeneracy yet thought to beard with the shadow of their past the substance of his present greatness and to dictate terms to a prince who came not as their servant but as their master after having delivered himself further in the same caustic style he asked them what answer they had to give and on being informed that they could give none till they had reported their reception to the senate he haughtily bid them be gone and do so aware that such conduct would highly incense the romans and very likely urge them to revenge it by throwing obstacles in the way of his coronation frederick consulted the pope as to what had best be done who advised him to send without delay a body of picked troops to occupy st peter's and the leontine quarter of the city in which that church stood promising that the papal guards on the spot would support the movement frederick accordingly dispatched during the night a thousand men on this service which they successfully performed the next morning june eighteenth eleven fifty five by sunrise he himself set out preceded by the pope for the city and passed into it by the golden gate before which his whole army in compact and resplendent array drew up at st peter's he was received by the pope who surrounded by his cardinals and prelates awaited the king's arrival on the steps of the great door 
the pontifical high mass was then sung and on its termination frederick enthroned amidst the princes and dignitaries of the empire was solemnly crowned emperor by the hands of the pope the whole congregation bursting out at so stirring and eventful a spectacle into acclamations of joy and triumph in the meantime a squadron of imperial troops took possession of the bridge near the castle of crescentius now st angelo over which the road into the heart of the town led and by so doing shut out the ill-disposed citizens on the right bank of the tiber from interrupting the ceremony when all was over at st peter's frederick issued out of the church with the crown on his head and mounting his horse while his suite continued on foot rode back through the golden gate to celebrate in his tent erected against the city halls the coronation banquet as to pope adrian he retired to his palace near st peter's so far everything had turned out well but a new scene was now to be acted for as the emperor and his soldiers divested of their armour on account of the great heat were carousing under the cool shade of their tents in honour of the day their toasts and songs were suddenly interrupted by the alarm that the romans had risen and were advancing over the tiber to attack the camp the truth was that the senate and citizens exasperated beyond measure at frederick's treatment of their ambassadors and at his superior generalship in occupying the city and effecting his coronation in their teeth had met at the capital while he was at st peter's and passed the resolution not to let so mortifying a day pass over without striking a blow in revenge wherefore as soon as the coronation was finished and the scene clear the furious populace burst over the tiber and after first butchering what few german soldiers still lingered imprudently at st peter's rushed on to the grand attack frederick no sooner heard this unwelcome news than he started from table gave the word to arm and sallied out to encounter the enemy the battle that ensued was maintained on both sides with unflinching courage and varied fortunes now the romans drove the germans beyond their lines now the germans pursued the romans into the heart of the city such was the hatred which each party felt against the other that not only the men but the women joined in the struggle when it had thus lasted till sunset victory declared for the germans the romans fled on all sides with a loss of more than a thousand killed or drowned and two hundred captured the emperor as otto of friesingen asserts had the extraordinary good fortune to lose in such an obstinate and bitter combat only two men one killed and one made prisoner such cried frederick as he beheld the defeat of the enemy and recollected the terms of the senate the day before such o rome is the price which thy prince pays for thy crown such the way in which we germans buy our empire on the morrow he turned over his prisoners to peter the prefect of rome who executed some as notorious ringleaders on the spot and allowed others to ransom themselves at exorbitant rates indeed that stern functionary would have put the whole of them to death had not adrian in whose breast this unfortunate outbreak had produced the liveliest regret interfered in their behalf so that it was reluctantly resolved to set them free notwithstanding his victory as no market for provisions could be opened for his army by reason of the animosity of the roman peasantry frederick was obliged to raise his camp and seek a more friendly and fruitful neighbourhood where the soldiers might enjoy repose after so trying a campaign the spot he removed to was near tivoli here he halted for several days and received a visit in his quarters from pope adrian who kept with the emperor the feast of saints peter and paul both sovereigns appeared at high mass on this occasion wearing their insignia of state after the service adrian solemnly absolved the emperor's troops from all guilt which the slaughter they had made of the romans in the late conflict might appear to lay them under the maxim adopted being that he who fights out of obedience to his prince against the enemy of the state must not be deemed a murderer but an avenger 
and yet frederick did not hesitate to seize an opportunity which now offered of breaking his oaths and of repaying the pope's good offices by invading his rights for on the citizens of tivoli offering him at his secret instigation the sovereignty of their city which belonged to the holy see he accepted it and only on adrian's determined opposition to such an usurpation affected to restore it with reservation of his imperial prerogatives over the place prerogatives which he could not define and which meant in fact nothing more than the renewal of his aggression at the next more favourable opportunity for now the complaints of his army worn out by fatigue exposed moreover to every vexation through the ever-increasing animosity of the italians and hence doubly impatient to return into germany from which it had been absent much longer than the terms of feudal service required obliged frederick to think of finishing his campaign and marching home directly if he did not mean to be left alone in the heart of a hostile country a predicament into which the desertion of his men was already beginning to betray him he accordingly took the road back into germany soon after he had made restitution to the pope as above described and after running many perils in his progress through regions so justly hostile to him regained his own states beyond the alps not so much gratified by the acquisition of the imperial crown as embittered by what he had gone through in pursuit of it and resolved not to delay longer than he could help a second invasion of italy which should compensate the mishaps and mortifications of the first End of chapter four Chapter five of Pope Adrian the Fourth and Historical Sketch by Richard Raby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter five. While Frederick was yet fighting his way home through Italy, Adrian came to face about and confront another foe in William the Norman King of Sicily. William had lately succeeded his father Roger, a wise and able monarch, to whom, however, his son, as so commonly happens, bore no sort of resemblance. But by his incapacity and total subjection under the influence of a profligate favorite of low birth named Rego, soon threw the state, which Roger had left in so prosperous a condition, into the worst disorder the breach between him and the pope arose out of a letter which the latter had occasion to address to the king at salerno in which the royal title was omitted and that of mere lord substituted adrian did this because william had assumed the crown of sicily without first asking it of the pope who as the feudal patron of that island by ancient compact with its norman conquerors under robert de guiscard in the time of pope leo the ninth a d ten fifty three justly felt his rights infringed by a proceeding which set at naught their established forms in revenge of this pretended insult william refused to negotiate with the ambassadors through whom it came and furthermore gave orders to his chancellor scitinius whom he had just made viceroy of apulia to attack the domain of the church which that officer accordingly did by laying siege to beneventum and devastating its territory but as this proceeding caused a number of disaffected crown vassals of apulia already secretly tampered with by agents of the greek emperor anxious to recover his lost sway in italy to revolt against the sicilian government many of whom in so doing marched to the relief of beneventum Citinius was soon obliged to raise the siege of that city and turn his arms against some more vulnerable point to this end he passed direct into the campagna and there set fire to the towns of caparano barbuco and todi after which he made his retreat demolishing by the way the walls of aquino and driving a crowd of monks out of their convents which he gave up to the plunder of the soldiers 
these events had transpired while frederick barbarossa was yet advancing towards rome to demand the imperial crown and on his arrival formed one of the heads of complaint to him on the part of the pope who hoped to use the strong arm of the professed champion of the church in redressing her wrongs frederick indeed expressed the warmest zeal in the pope's cause and none the less so as it presented under the appearance of a sacred duty a prospect so inviting to his own ambition but as we have seen he was reluctantly compelled by his murmuring soldiers to close his campaign and return home he did not however lose sight of sicily which as will be described in the sequel gave rise to a fresh and sharper quarrel between him and the pope disappointed in his hopes of assistance from frederick adrian with characteristic energy resolved to assist himself and rejoined to the ruffianism of william with a ban of excommunication a proceeding which instantly decided in the pope's cause several of the most powerful nobles of apulia especially robert count of loritelli the king's cousin andrew count of rupi canino richard count of aquila and robert prince of capua men who like the bulk of their order were impatient to shake off the oppressive and ignominious yoke of the royal favourite rajo backed by these who again were secretly encouraged by the court of constantinople adrian followed up his ban of excommunication by invading at the head of his troops the terra di lavoro which he totally subdued and then proceeded to beneventum where he fixed his headquarters william who in the meantime was in sicily and lulled asleep to every interest under the noxious influence of rejo no sooner became aware of his bad fortune across the water where owing to the events just related all his italian possessions with the exception of naples amalfi sorrento and a few other towns and castles of secondary importance were wrested from him than he presently shook off his lethargy sailed over to salerno and from that city sent ambassadors to the pope to negotiate a peace to this step he was urged all the more by finding out that emmanuel the greek emperor after refusing to stand his ally at the beginning of the war was in correspondence through his minister paleologus with adrian trying to procure from the latter the cession of three seaports of apulia in consideration of a large sum of money and of the promise to expel the sicilian king from his italian dominions the offers which william made were namely to pay a sum equivalent to that rendered by emmanuel to surrender the three seaports in question as an indemnification for the damage done by scythinius and to swear fealty to the pope as the liege lord of sicily at first adrian doubted if these terms were genuine and sent a cardinal to salerno to learn the truth on being advised that all was straightforward he declared his readiness to accept them but a cabal in the german interest among the cardinals now put in such a strong opposition to the pope's intention that taken by surprise he dropped it and retracted his favourable answer to william the truth was a reconciliation between adrian and william would have seriously embarrassed frederick barbarossa's designs on sicily to say nothing of the protection which such an event would secure to the pope against those farther aggressions on the church which the emperor had in view driven to desperation by the final decision of the pope william who with all his faults seems still to have been capable of a rash energy when real danger stared him in the face resolved to throw himself again on the chance of war collecting a formidable armament by sea and land he invested brundusium which with the exception of the citadel had fallen into the hands of michael ducas the greek general the citadel which could not be subdued by arms was obliged at last to yield to famine when in the moment that the garrison was about to close with the terms of surrender proposed by the enemy william came up with his army and obliged the greek commander instead of taking possession of the citadel to face about and fight a pitched battle for the town the struggle was obstinate and bloody fortune often changed sides but at last declared for the sicilians into whose hands ducas himself fell 
the recovery of brundusium which followed this victory seasonably placed at william's disposal a number of rich greek captives whom he sent to palermo much ready money and precious property besides ships and stores a crowd of apulian malcontents had also the misfortune to fall into his power on whom he did not fail to wreak his vengeance by executing some blinding and maiming others and selling the rest into slavery flushed with this success he next marched to bari here he met with no resistance but on the contrary an affecting appeal to his mercy in the spectacle of the citizens coming out before him dressed in sackcloth in token of submission so solemn a humiliation however could not atone in the king's eye for their crime in having demolished the citadel of the town because it refused to turn disloyal when the rebellion first broke out to their entreaties for pardon he sternly replied that he should deal out strict justice to them that as they had not spared his house he should not spare their houses a respite of two days only was allowed them in which to quit their homes with their goods upon its expiration the entire city with its walls was reduced to a heap of ruins struck with terror at so cruel a vengeance the rest of the revolted apulian towns hastened to send in their submission whereupon william turned his arms at once against beneventum where not only the pope but also prince robert of capua and several other leaders of the rebellion resided as the king approached the prince of capua seized with terror fled but with so little caution as to fall into an ambush set for him by his vassal and fellow-rebel richard count of fondi who took the prince his son and daughter prisoners and delivered them to his sovereign by which piece of seasonable perfidy richard atoned for his treason and recovered the royal favour as to robert he was shipped off to palermo thrown into a dungeon where his eyes were put out in this sad condition however he did not long survive as the severity of his treatment soon brought death to his relief with such melancholy proofs of the mutability of worldly fortune before his eyes and viewing moreover the success of his enemy as a sign of the divine disapprobation of his having been so weak as to refuse terms of peace against his better judgment adrian now resolved to lose no time in doing what was yet in his power towards repairing his error and began by successfully requesting the sicilian king to give up farther pursuit of his vengeance against the rest of the rebel chiefs still shut up in beneventum and to pardon them on condition of their quitting the kingdom he next offered to close with those terms of peace the rejection of which had caused the present war and sent ambassadors to the king on the subject william received them respectfully and opened negotiations with them the pope on his part engaged to invest the king in fiaf with the kingdom of sicily the duchy of apulia the principality of capua naples salerno and malfi with the march and with all that he claimed on his side the marsa the king in return engaged to swear fealty to the pope to defend him against his enemies and to pay him a fixed yearly tribute for apulia calabria and the march these formed the principal articles of the treaty now agreed to but there were others included in which the king took advantage of his position as conqueror to exact terms in favour of the secular and to the detriment of the spiritual power in his states by these terms the royal right to confirm canonical elections was extended appeals to rome from apulia were restricted while in sicily they were wholly abolished as well as the right to send legates into the island this peace was signed in the church of st marcianus near beneventum where in the presence of a splendid array of nobles and of a vast crowd of people the king of sicily prostrated himself in homage at the feet of the pope who then embraced his august vassal and invested him with fiafs of sicily apulia and capua by presenting him with three standards representing those states after all was over the king made rich presents of plate and precious garments to the cardinals in the suite of the pope of whom he then took leave and returned to palermo shortly afterwards adrian published a bull in which the peace was confirmed 
on his way from beneventum to rome he visited orvieto a city which had for a long time stood in open rebellion against him as its prince but had recently returned to its duty here he stayed some time and received the most loyal demonstrations from the citizens on whom he conferred many tokens of his paternal regard from orvieto he proceeded to viterbo for the winter and then repaired to rome End of chapter 5chapter six of pope adrian the fourth an historical sketch by richard raby this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six soon after his accession adrian received among other letters of congratulation one from henry the second king of england who had succeeded to his crown at the same time as the pope this letter was as follows a sweet breath of air hath breathed in our ears inasmuch as we learn that the news of your elevation hath scattered like a refulgent aurora the darkness of the desolation of the church the apostolic see rejoiceth in having obtained such a consolation of her widowhood all the churches rejoice at beholding the new light arise and hope to behold it expand to broad day but in particular our west rejoiceth that a new light hath arisen to illuminate the globe of the earth and that by divine favour the west hath restored that sun of christianity which towards the east was set wherefore most holy father we sharing in the general jubilee at your honours and celebrating with devout praise the bounties of the divine majesty will lay open to you our desires confiding as we do with filial devotion in your paternal goodness for if the carnal son exposeth to his father in confidence his carnal desires how much more should not the spiritual son do so with regard to his spiritual one assuredly among other desires of our heart we do not a little desire that as the almighty's right arm hath chosen your most reverend person to be spiritually planted like a tree of life in the midst of paradise and to be transplanted from this land of ours into his orchard we will chiefly take care to reform by your conduct and doctrine all the churches that all generations may call your land blessed through your beatitude this too we thirst for with a sincere heart that the spirit of tempest which is wont to rage furiously about the pinnacle of honour may never wrest you from the concern of your sanctification lest by reason of any deficiency in you the deepest abyss of disgrace should succeed to the highest summit of dignity and this we ardently long for that as the regulation of the church universal belongs to you you will take care to create such cardinals free of reproach as shall know how to appreciate your burden and be willing and competent to aid you in supporting it not regarding ties of country quality of birth or extent of power but that they love god hate avarice thirst after justice and burn with the zeal of souls nor are we slightly affected by the desire that as the unworthiness of ministers is detrimental above all things to the church you will vigilantly watch whenever your providence shall happen to be petitioned touching the collation of benefices lest any unworthy person intrude into the patrimony of the crucified and seeing that the holy land blessed by the origin of our redemption consecrated by the life and death of christ a land which christian devotion holds in particular respect is distracted by incursion of the infidels and polluted by their abominations we wish from our very soul that you would provide men of your own devout solicitude in its defence and in regard of that empire of constantinople once so illustrious now so woefully desolate what christian man ought not to desire that by your care and prudence it may receive timely consolation for the rest we confide and hope 
in the lord that as you have not failed while rising from virtue to virtue and from honour to honour to shine according to the exigence of each of them so you will not fail now that you are called to the apogee of apostolical elevation to illustrate and inflame the subject church in such a manner as shall permit no one to hide himself from your light and heat and that after your death you will leave behind such vestiges of sanctity that your native land which congratulates itself on your happy beginning will find much glory in the lord in your happier end finally we request of your paternity with full confidence that you will be pleased to remember us our family and kingdom especially in your prayers and vows a few months after the receipt of this letter adrian was visited by his renowned countryman john of salisbury afterwards bishop of shot who arrived in a diplomatic capacity from king henry to procure the papal sanction to a projected conquest of ireland by england the motives to this ambitious scheme which william the conqueror and henry i had also entertained were alleged to be the civilization of the irish people and the reformation of the irish church both of which were represented as given over to barbaric anarchy and the most crying abuses and indeed such was the real state of civil and religious affairs in that country in the twelfth century as will be shown lower down that the motives in question derived the greatest weight from the circumstance and induced the pope to give the sanction requested this he did in the following brief adrian bishop servant of the servants of god to his most dear son in christ the illustrious king of the english health and apostolical benediction thy magnificence thinketh praiseworthy and fruitfully touching the propagation of thy glorious name over the earth and the laying up of a reward of eternal felicity in heaven when like a catholic prince thou dost project the extension of the boundaries of the church the proclamation of the christian faith to ignorant and rude people and the extirpation of the weeds of vice from the lord's vineyard and when to the better execution hereof thou dost request the advice and favour of the apostolic see in which matter we feel confident that as thou shalt proceed with higher counsel and greater discretion so thou wilt make under the lord's favour the happier progress seeing that those things usually reach a good issue which have sprung out of an ardour for the faith and love of religion certainly there can be no doubt that ireland as well as all the isles which christ the son of justice hath illuminated and which have borne testimony to the christian faith are subject to st peter and the most holy roman church on which account we are all the more ready to plant therein the plantation of the faith and the seed which is grateful to god as we discover on close examination it is required of us forasmuch then as thou hast signified to us most clear son in christ that thou art wishful to enter the island of ireland to subdue that people under the laws and to root out of it the weeds of vice and art wishful to pay to st peter a pension of one penny a year for each house and to preserve intact the rights of the church in that country we regarding favourably and about safing to thy petition our gracious assent hold it to be a grateful and acceptable thing that thou shouldst enter that island to extend the boundaries of the church to stem the torrent of crime to correct morals to introduce virtue to augment the christian religion and to execute what thy mind may have found good for god's honour and the country's prosperity and let the people thereof receive thee honourably and respect thee as their lord the rights of the church remaining intact and saving the pension to st peter and the most holy roman church of one penny a year for each house and shouldst thou be so fortunate as to accomplish what thou hast planned strive to improve the irish nation by good morals and act in such a manner by thyself as well as by those whom thou shalt employ and whom thou shalt first have proved to be trustworthy by means of their fidelity their opinions and conduct 
that the church may be adorned the christian faith extended and everything that belongs to the honour of god and salvation of souls so ordered by thee in ireland as to qualify thee to deserve an eternal reward in heaven and a glorious name on earth through all ages this famous brief by which henry the second of england held himself divinely authorized to conquer ireland is strongly disapproved of by many writers especially by irish ones who will not alloy it the least excuse but overwhelm it with abusive censure and yet the plain truth is adrian meant it as he worded it for ireland's good however false the grant of constantine the great on which the claim set up for st peter's dominion over the islands is founded may have been proved in later times to be yet it is certain that both the grant and claim in question were in the eleventh and twelfth centuries firmly believed in by all orthodox christians just as much so as that the pope was literally our saviour's vicar on earth before whose powers every other had to bow that the king of england was secretly guided by worldly motives while ostensibly professing religious ones was his concern and not the pope's whose business was to weigh the merits of the case not by reasons imputed but by those propounded which if he found them from the religious point of view of his time sound he was justified in accepting now there is the best evidence in contemporary writings especially in those of giraldus and st bernard that ireland was as above said given up in the twelfth century to the worst demoralization in church and state that a country not wholly pagan or savage could be giraldus who travelled in ireland in the suite of king john and attentively observed its condition expresses in his work written on the subject his surprise that a nation in which the christian faith had been planted so far back as the days of st patrick and had gone on increasing more or less ever since should yet in his age be so ignorant in the very rudiments of religion a nation as he proceeds to describe it filthy in the extreme buried in vice and of all nations the most ignorant of the rudiments of the faith in support of this severe censure he accuses the irish of despising matrimony of being addicted to incest of refusing to pay tithes and of totally neglecting attendance at church in another place he writes that the people in many districts continued still to be pagans through the indifference of the clergy st bernard draws a picture not less darkly shaded in his life of st malachi adverting to the state of the irish church on the promotion of that saint to the episcopacy he describes how the new bishop soon found out that he had to do with brutes and not with men how that nowhere he had met with such barbarism of every sort nowhere found a race so perverse in their morals so savagely opposed to religious rites so impious towards the faith so headstrong against discipline so barbarous towards the laws so filthy in their habits of life a people christians in name but heathens in practice who paid no tithes who contracted no lawful marriages who never confessed their sins who had hardly any one among them to ask or give a penance in whose churches neither the voice of the preacher nor the chorus of the chanters was ever heard the political was in complete harmony with the religious state of the country parcelled out among petty kings and chiefs who seemed only to subsist by devouring each other and in the crush and tumult of their feuds stood so thick on the ground as hardly to have elbow-room the whole island presented one untiring round of treacheries massacres conflagrations and plunderings wholesale and retail such as is without example elsewhere in history with no other hope so long as left to itself of anything but an aggravation of the evil if that were possible that adrian with such a state of things before his eyes should readily give his sanction to a project which however liable to be clogged by human imperfection could not at any rate make things worse but haply might make them better was surely a proceeding quite consistent with the character of a wise and zealous pope 
of a pope too who lived and thought when the crusades were at their height and who may therefore be very well supposed to have viewed the condition of ireland once the island of saints but now the scene of worse than pagan abominations as not less calculated for the efforts of holy chivalry than palestine if then it can appear that adrian might have acted in his brief to henry just as well out of motives of religious duty as out of those of court policy it is a perverse thing to award him the latter rather than the former because to do so is to make him not less absurdly than wickedly inconsistent with his previous and subsequent career which was marked by one unswerving purpose to defend the church against the encroachment of secular power to maintain her doctrines intact and to extend her boundaries to the utmost besides it should not be forgotten that his brief was confirmed by his illustrious successor alexander the third who thus gave his testimony to the uprightness of intention which originated it as well as to its proper adaptation in the spirit of that age to the emergency which elicited it an emergency which from the terms used by alexander in conveying his confirmation would seem by no means to have diminished but rather to have increased in the meantime in short it is nothing better than a logical solecism to wish to maintain that two such popes as adrian the fourth and alexander the third educated in the school of the sublime hildebrand and ranking among the very foremost of his disciples by the intelligent and dauntless manner in which they withstood the storm of imperial usurpation which threatened to shatter the church under their pontificates should deviate from their glorious career to belie their principles the one by granting out of national prejudice and court sycophancy a license of spoliation to a king of england and the other by confirming it out of reasons just as unworthy as it was providence did not see fit to allow the views either of adrian or henry to be carried out as originally intended for the expedition of the king against ireland was put off on account of various obstacles for fourteen years during which term the papal brief was consigned to the royal archives and there forgotten nor was it till six years after the actual invasion of ireland by strongbow that its existence was remembered by henry who anxious to consolidate his new conquest had the authority of adrian's brief renewed by procuring another in confirmation of it from alexander and then caused such documents to be read up before the irish bishops assembled in synod at waterford by whom his sovereignty had already without any reference to papal commands been acknowledged that the english sway turned out so unjust and disastrous to ireland reflects no blame on adrian than whom no one would have more deplored the evil and striven against its true causes than he rather ought he from the spirit of his brief the only fair test to apply to him to be regarded as the head of that small unfortunately so very small band of englishmen who have ever meant well to the sister isle and who to speak the sober truth if their views might prevail would alone be likely to promote her true prosperity by shielding her not only against her outward but her inward foes to which latter consisting in those elements of social discord so profusely so deeply rooted as it would seem in the nature of her people she owes by far the worst portion of her calamities no doubt pope adrian a man of the most shrewd practical intellect and from the circumstances of his life of the deepest experience in human nature saw clearly enough then what continues to be seen so clearly by men of his stamp now that ireland could never truly prosper so long as left to her own management by reason of the incurable defect mentioned above and that therefore to sanction her sisterly not her slavish connection with a nation like the english so eminent for those very qualities of order and self-maintenance in which she is so wanting would be a work of as great charity in itself as of mutual advantage to the parties concerned 
for the rest it should not be forgotten that however much the english occupation of ireland may through a series of causes not to be foreseen in adrian's time have turned out a curse yet the occupation in question had the immediate effect of producing the reform of those religious abuses which constituted the worst misfortunes of the country and which till henry had actually arrived thither continued in all their hideous deformity this happy result took place under the auspices of henry at the senate of cashel summoned by him at the beginning of the year eleven seventy two and attended by all the heads of the irish clergy besides the brief in question adrian gave to john of salisbury as the latter relates in the last chapter of his metalogicus a gold ring set with a fine emerald for the king his master in token of investment with the lordship of ireland which important jewel whose rare virtues john of salisbury adds were he to describe it would require a volume to enumerate was also deposited in the royal archives not only henry the second of england but louis the seventh of france a year or two later solicited adrian's approbation of a scheme of foreign conquest which in this case was intended to be carried out in spain where the french monarch pretended he wanted to serve the church by expelling the saracens but the pope treated the application of louis very differently to that of henry for in his brief of reply after awarding all praise to the religious zeal alleged by the french king as his motive he points out the flagrant wrong which louis would commit in gratuitously interfering in the affairs of an independent nation like spain the consent of whose princes could alone justify such a step so that until such consent could be obtained he adrian could do nothing else than totally condemn and warn him against his project adrian's conduct in this instance was not less consistent than in the other for as over ireland in his character of an island he believed himself to possess through the supposed testament of constantine certain rights and thought proper to exercise them so over spain being ignorant of any such rights he arrogated none but acted as became him on the general principles of christian justice End of chapter six chapter seven of pope adrian the fourth an historical sketch by richard raby this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven it was most likely on occasion of this embassy that john of salisbury although he mentions other visits paid by him to adrian held the interesting conversation with the english pope which he reports at length in his polycratius in that work he says he well remembers how during a sojourn at the papal court in beneventum he was treated on the most familiar footing by his holiness whose habit it was to gather round him a few select friends with whom he would freely discuss a variety of topics and how among others he once asked john to state candidly what he knew of the people's opinion touching the roman church and her head whereupon the envoy of henry using the liberty of the spirit told without disguise all that he had heard in various parts on the subject for example that the roman church the mother of all others showed herself according to many not so much a mother as a stepmother to her daughters that scribes and pharisees sat in her who loaded other men's shoulders with burdens which they would not touch even with their fingers that these said scribes and pharisees played the tyrant over the clergy and bore no palpable resemblance to such shepherds as tread the true path of life but that they heaped up rich furniture ornamented their tables with gold and silver plate distracted the church with controversies and by setting the pastors and the people by the ears that they in no manner commiserated the sorrows of the unfortunate but made merry over the plunder of churches and administered justice not according to the truth but the price then that other people said the roman pontiff himself was a tyrant and that while the churches which their ancestors had built were falling to ruin and the altars stood desolate he appeared abroad arrayed in gold and purple 
but that the divine wrath would eventually overtake such priests as lived in pride and luxury and levied taxes on the provinces like men who meant to equal the wealth of croesus for the lord had said that as they measured out to others so would he measure out to them and the ancient of days could not lie upon hearing this and much more to the same effect the pope asked john of salisbury what he himself thought who replied that the question very much perplexed him as on the one hand he feared to pass for a flatterer if he went contrary to public opinion and on the other to give offence if he spoke the truth nevertheless as cardinal guido clement had bore witness in favour of the people he john of salisbury dared not contradict him for the cardinal had said that the church of rome contained a world of avarice and deceit from which every evil sprung this he had not said in a corner but before all his brethren in presence of pope eugenius and that he john of salisbury would not hesitate to declare that as far as his experience went he had never seen anywhere clergymen of greater virtue or more opposed to avarice than those of rome such was the gravity and modesty of many of them that in those respects they equalled fabricius while in possessing the true faith they had the advantage over him then with regard to the pope himself as his holiness insisted on being plainly spoken to he would say that inasmuch as the holy ghost could not err so whatever his holiness might teach must be followed though what his holiness might do was not always to be imitated his holiness was styled father and lord of all but why if he was the father did he require presents from his children and why if he was the lord did he not strike awe into the romans curb their insolence and reclaim them to their duty at all this the pope laughed heartily and expressed himself well pleased at having found a man so honest and plain-spoken adding that if ever he should hear anything further to the same purpose by no means to omit reporting it adrian then proceeded to pass his own conduct in review said many things for and against himself and made reflections on the arduousness of the papal office affirming that no other was so full of cares and that no man was more wretched than a roman pontiff for his throne was set with thorns his mantle pierced with sharp points and so heavy as to weigh the strongest shoulders to the ground much sooner would he prefer never to have left his native english soil or to have remained forever hidden in his cell at st rome's than to have entered such straits but the divine dispensation had called him and he dared not disobey he further said that it had always been the lord's pleasure that he should grow between the hammer and the anvil that now he prayed the lord would be pleased to put his hand under the burden as it was become insupportable the pope then concluded his observations by relating to the company the fable of the belly and the members which the charges laid at his door suggested to him and which john of salisbury gives at length in adrian's words a fable by the way which assuredly has lost none of its point since those times but remains as pregnant with wisdom for the nineteenth as for the twelfth century pope anastasius the fourth had conferred on the knights hospitallers of jerusalem the privilege of exemption from tithes on their property in consideration of its exclusive destination to the relief of pilgrims and of the poor this privilege soon gave rise to a quarrel between the knights and the clergy of jerusalem who naturally took it ill that so important a source of revenue as the tithes on the possession of the order of st john no doubt constituted should thus be stopped the patriarch reproached the grand master with abusing his privilege and at last grew so embittered that he drew up a charge against him of acts of aggression on the rights of the oriental church for example that the hospitallers allowed all such persons to attend their church as were excommunicated by the bishops and did not even refuse such outcasts the holy sacrament and extreme unction when dying as well as christian burial when dead 
that when for some great crime silence was imposed on the churches of a town or district the knights were always the first to ring their bells and call the people on whom the interdict was laid to mass for no other purpose than to get the offerings and fees which otherwise would accrue to the parish church that the priests of st john did not on their ordination present themselves according to ancient custom before the bishop of the diocese to ask his permission to do duty therein that the bishop was never advised of the lawful or unlawful suspension of a priest lastly that the knights of st john absolutely refused to pay tithes on their property from these general charges the patriarch next descended to particular ones of affronts to himself for instance that as the hospital of st john stood opposite the church of the holy sepulchre the knights had erected their buildings on a scale of magnificence superior to the latter church purely out of a feeling to insult the patriarch moreover that when the patriarch ascended according to traditional usage the place of our saviour's passion to absolve the people from their sins and preach to them the hospitallers invariably set out their bells a-ringing with such violence as plainly proved that they meant to drown his voice and interrupt him in the performance of his duty that when he had often complained to the citizens of this misconduct and these had expostulated with the perpetrators the latter only replied that they would yet play him worse turns that they had in fact kept their word for they had shot arrows at him in the church itself while celebrating there the divine offices these arrows he the patriarch had caused to be picked up and exposed in a bundle on mount calvary as a memorial with these charges the patriarch attended by other oriental prelates set out for italy to lay his case before the pope after running many perils by reason of the war then going on between the pope and the king of sicily the party at last reached beneventum the trial that took place lasted several days when the result of the pleadings for and against was that adrian became convinced of the hollowness of the accusations laid by the patriarch against the knights of st john and therefore refused to grant the redress sought for namely to annul the patent of privileges conferred by anastasius william of tyre who describes the transaction as a partisan of the patriarch plainly says that the pope took bribes to decide as he did but Paggi denies this flatly, and affirms that Adrian proceeded in this, as well as in every other act of his authority, conscientiously and disinterestedly. Indeed, it is rather unfortunate for William of Tyre that the three cardinals whom he alone accepts from the charge of bribery, two, namely Octavian and John of St. Martin, afterwards figured as principal actors in the scandalous schism which rent the church after Adrian's death the first as frederick barbarossa's antipope under the name of victor the fourth in opposition to alexander the third the lawful pope the second as victor's legate and as chief supporter after his death of anacletus the third whom the emperor next started against alexander peter of blois too in his letter to cardinal papentius describes octavian as having passed his whole life in amassing riches wherewith to disturb the church and as having been but too successful in corrupting a powerful party in the roman curia to his views it had always been a leading concern of the popes to heal the schism between constantinople and rome adrian did his part though fruitlessly towards so great a work shortly after his accession he sent to the emperor constantine legates on the subject who also carried a letter from the pope to basilius bishop of Thessalonica, one of the most influential and well-disposed prelates in that day in the east this letter was to request his cooperation in bringing about the reunion of the severed churches basilius made answer that unity might easily be restored as no essential difference of belief existed between the two communions in both of which one and the same doctrine was taught and one and the same lamb namely christ offered up for the sins of the world though without doubt some minor discrepancies existed between the two whose removal however belonged wholly to the pope 
who as he had the will had also the power no less than our saviour himself to unite into one what stood now so widely separated basilius would thus seem to have been of opinion that he was in no wise cut off from the catholic church notwithstanding the oriental might differ in certain rites from the western church it was an old and gross abuse of the age that the nobles asserted the right to seize the effects of a bishop on his death this abuse did not escape severe censure from several synods but pope adrian it was who condemned it the most effectually by his bull to berengarius archbishop of narbonne a d eleven fifty six on occasion of ermengarda viscountess of narbonne renouncing the abuse in favour of that prelate which renunciation the papal bull was issued to confirm in the year eleven fifty raymond count of barcelona made a similar renunciation by charter when about to go on a distant and perilous journey in it he says i hereby promise to god to abolish the detestable custom which has hitherto prevailed in my states to wit the custom whereby my bailiffs plundered the goods of a bishop when he died a proceeding which i own to be contrary to divine and human laws wherefore i renounce the said custom and order that for the future if anything be found in the house or grounds of a bishop deceased it shall be reserved for his successor end of chapter seven chapter eight of pope adrian the fourth an historical sketch by richard raby this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight the peace which adrian had concluded with the king of sicily was soon seized by frederick barbarossa as the pretext for a new quarrel with the church the grounds on which the german despot professed to be aggrieved were as follows a predecessor of his lothar the second had in his italian war in the foregoing century obliged the king of sicily to own the feudal superiority of germany over apulia pope innocent the second who protested against this proceeding as a violation of his rights could only so far induce lothair to respect them as to agree to let their lawful owner for the future jointly exercise them with their lawless usurper so that when the sicilian king as duke of apulia should be presented at the ceremony of his installation with a flag the pope was to hold the pole with one hand and the emperor with the other frederick barbarossa renewed this right of joint lordship over apulia by a concordat with eugenius the third in which he expressly stipulated not to make any treaty with the king of sicily without the previous consent of the pope who however was not required to enter into any such obligation towards the german monarch and yet frederick now put on the face of an injured man declaring that what had not been stipulated had yet always been taken for granted and that adrian by making peace with king william unknown to the emperor had frequently violated the concordat in the height of his ill-will an incident fell out which gave free vent to his animosity against the pope to settle his power in burgundy he summoned a diet of the empire to meet at besancon in october eleven fifty seven this diet was numerously and splendidly attended not only by german but by foreign princes and ambassadors from all parts of europe among the rest by two cardinals named roland and bernard as legates from the pope the emperor received their credentials in his oratory where he gave them a special audience at which they also presented him a letter from adrian who complained in it of the impunity with which frederick had allowed certain marauding knights to detain and plunder eskill archbishop of lund while travelling through burgundy to his diocese in chiding him for so faithless a discharge of his duty as sworn champion of the roman church the pope reminded the emperor of the favours he owed the church especially mentioning among them his imperial crown not that she repented of having so far obliged him on the contrary she would rejoice if she could confer on him still greater benefits 
as frederick listened to this letter which his chancellor reynald read up to him he reddened with anger at that part of it which spoke of his crown as a gift of the church but at the word benefits he could not control himself for by this word he insisted in the blindness of passion that the pope meant to assert that the empire was a fief of the holy see the fact was the original word beneficium did signify in the corrupt latin of the middle ages a fief as well as a benefit in general and this was enough for the emperor's humour who would listen to no explanation from the legates that the word was used not in its technical but its classical sense in the heat of the dispute which ensued cardinal roland afterwards pope alexander the third exclaimed from whom then hath the emperor his dignity if not from the pope whereupon the count palatine otho of bavaria one of the courtiers present seized by a fit of fury drew his sword and rushed towards the cardinal but was checked in his purpose by frederick who threw himself between the two and then closed the audience by ordering the legates to be escorted back to rome with injunctions not to deviate from the directest line of route nor to tarry in any ecclesiastical domain through which they might pass historians are agreed that adrian had no intention in the present case of practically asserting as frederick in his politic wrath said he did the feudal superiority in question the english pope however was not the less a stickler for that superiority in theory as well as cardinal roland and the rest of the hierarchy a superiority which pope gregory the seventh supported by the feelings and convictions of christendom at his day taught as follows that the pope as vicar on earth of our lord in heaven ought to stand superior over every human power and sought to realize it as the only means of reforming the frightful disorders of that age frederick barbarossa on the other hand took as was natural to a man like him bent on crushing the spiritual beneath the temporal power the opposite side of the question a side which was just as repugnant to the feeling of the overwhelming majority of christendom then as it was a century before nay which was at variance with his own conscience if one may judge from his conduct at a later period when abandoned by fortune and his pride humbled in the dust he was driven to hearken to its voice for the present he proclaimed the only doctrine which his pride could brook namely that he held his crown from god alone to whose servant the pope it simply belonged to perform the ceremony of coronation this doctrine of his imperial dignity he caused to be stated in a circular which he addressed to all the provinces of germany in vindication of his behaviour towards the papal legates a measure rendered imperative by the religious temper of the age in this circular he denounces all who differ from its views as enemies of the doctrine of our lord and his apostles as in short their slanderers and among other extravagancies of his virulence declares that one cause among the rest why he so unceremoniously dismissed the legates was the discovery which he had made of blank papers in their possession ready signed and sealed which they could fill up at pleasure and which were meant to empower them to dismantle the altars plunder the sacred vessels and deface the crucifixes in the german churches he further informs the bishops of germany that he and he alone it is who really strives to protect their liberties against the roman see whose yoke they groaned under those however to whom this consoling piece of news was sent knew but too well what a mockery the word liberty was in the mouth of a man who like frederick had long ago trampled on the concordat of worms and who disposed of the benefices of the church after the arbitrary manner of henry the fourth to subserve his political ends as companion piece to his circular frederick published an edict forbidding in future all correspondence between his clergy and rome the account which the cardinals roland and bernard gave on their arrival at rome of the way in which they had been treated by frederick created a lively sensation at the papal court 
the imperial party at the conclave sought to exculpate their patron in the face of the reproaches heaped upon him by ascribing all the blame to the ignorance and mismanagement of the legates in the midst of the conflicting opinions of his clergy pope adrian deeply felt the indignity which he had suffered in the persons of his representatives but did not allow himself to be betrayed into any violent manifestation of displeasure on the contrary after the first excitement of his feelings was over he wisely resolved to do all in his power to conciliate the emperor without derogating from his own dignity to this end he wrote a brief of which the substance is as follows to all the archbishops and bishops of germany as often as anything is attempted in the church contrary to the honour of god and the salvation of souls it should be the care of our brother bishops and of all who profess to act according to the holy spirit to chastise such deeds as have been wickedly done in a manner pleasing to god our illustrious son frederick emperor of the romans we say it with profound sorrow hath lately done what so far as we know is without example in the times of his predecessors for on our sending him two of our worthiest brethren namely cardinals bernard of st clement and roland of st mark our chancellor he appeared at first to receive them with cordiality but the next day when they read to him our letter he broke out into such violence of passion at a certain expression contained therein namely we have conferred on thee the benefit of the crown that it is lamentable to think of the reproaches which he is said to have cast on them of the insults which he obliged them to bear from him of the dishonourable manner in which he dismissed them from his presence and drove them out of his states and then he issued an edict forbidding you to leave the kingdom to visit the apostolic see concerning which things though we are much troubled yet we derive the greatest consolation from this that he did not go to such lengths by your advice or by that of his princes wherefore we feel assured that by your advice it will be easy to recover him from the infatuation of his mind for which reason brethren since it is plain that in this matter not only our but your cause and that of the entire church is at stake we exhort you in the lord to oppose yourselves as a wall before the house of god and to spare no pains in reclaiming as soon as possible our said son to the right path taking special care at the same time that reynald his chancellor and the count palatine who dared to vomit out the greatest blasphemies against our said delegates and the roman church make full and public satisfaction to the end that as many ears were wounded by their virulent speech so many may be reclaimed by their return to the right path and let our said son reflect on past and present events and enter on that path along which it is known that justinian and other catholic emperors walk as by following their example he will not fail to obtain honour on earth and happiness in heaven you too should you succeed in reclaiming him will at once offer a grateful tribute of obedience to st peter and assert your own and the church's liberty at all events our illustrious son will learn from your admonitions will learn from the infallible gospel that the most holy roman church built by god's hand on a most firm rock however much she may be shaken by the winds will yet endure throughout all ages under the lord's protection this brief threw those to whom it was addressed into no small perplexity for while on the one hand they secretly leaned to the cause of the church they had become on the other so cowed and truckling under the iron despotism of the emperor that they felt themselves unequal to the task of responding to the pope as their duty prompted so that they resolved after some deliberation on the subject to lay the brief before frederick and to square their reply according to his remarks 
these were a tissue of the most contemptible subterfuges and trifling as for example that he had issued no edict against his clergy passing into italy as pilgrims and all others that wished to go thither on reasonable grounds attested by their bishops could still do so that he was chiefly actuated in his proceedings by the wish to correct those abuses under which his churches were overtaxed and the discipline of his convents almost ruined that though god had raised the church by means of the state yet the church now sought to overthrow the state a requital which he frederick viewed as by no means divine that the evil designs of the church against the empire were not only proved by her writings but by the pictures which contrary to the imperial wishes were allowed to continue undefaced at rome under one of which representing the emperor conrad kneeling to the pope and receiving the crown an inscription asserted that he did so as the vassal of his holiness for the rest the bishops begged of the pope to appease their sovereign by apologetic letters so that the church might continue at peace and the empire lose none of its dignity adrian smiled at the perverse spirit of pride which this reply from the german hierarchy showed frederick to be possessed of and took only the firmer resolution to get the better of him by opposing a calm dignity to his passion he accordingly selected cardinals henry and hyacinth men of more experience in diplomacy than the rest of their brethren in the conclave to go as legates on a new embassy to the emperor who in the meanwhile had arrived at augsburg to review his troops previous to his second invasion of italy the two cardinals after being plundered and imprisoned on their passage of the alps into tyrol by robber knights who infested those parts and aware of the quarrel between the emperor and the pope thought they might thus turn it to account but were severely punished for their pains by henry duke of bavaria who freed the sufferers enabled them to reach augsburg in safety where they had audience of the emperor the brief which they read to him from the pope expressed the sorrow of his holiness at finding how greatly the term beneficium had been misunderstood and declared that no other than its ordinary meaning in the latin language was intended by it and that the meaning of fief had not for a moment been entertained moreover the word contulimus in speaking of conferring the crown was explained to have meant not that his holiness had done so as though the emperor were his vassal but that he had simply set it on the emperor's head an act whereby it might be supposed that at least a feeling of thankfulness and good will would be produced the brief ascribed to maliciously disposed persons the wrong interpretation given to the pope's words which had so deeply incensed the emperor and concluded by recommending to his good favor the legates now accredited to him frederick professed himself pacified by this brief and as soon as some other points of difference were at his request satisfactorily settled he embraced the cardinals in token of his reconciliation with the pope and loaded them with such rich presents that they returned home in the best humour end of chapter eight Chapter Nine of Pope Adrian the Fourth and Historical Sketch by Richard Ravy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine. This reconciliation lasted but a short time, for as Adrian was not a character to tamely submit to any invasion of his rights, he could not long keep on terms with a man like Frederick Barbarossa towards the end of eleven fifty eight frederick after reducing milan held a great diet on the roncalian plains between cremona and placentia at which not only his german princes and prelates but many italian bishops and nearly all the consuls of the cities of lombardy were present a papal legate also appeared at this diet frederick caused certain doctors of roman law from bologna to pronounce what were and what were not his legal rights in italy 
after due investigation they awarded to their formidable client such a monopoly of fisheries mines customs taxes and other dues under the name of regalities that hardly anything in the entire country remained over to which the emperor could not lay claim under that title the consequence was that the various towns dioceses convents and chapters saw themselves deprived at a blow of rights and properties which they had long possessed and fairly acquired it was impossible for adrian not to look with the liveliest displeasure at such old stale spoliation on the part of his imperial son whose victims formally submitted to their fate out of sheer terror and impotence of resistance but when in the face of former oaths and pledges to uphold and make good all the rights and properties of the holy see frederick began with reckless effrontery to wrong that see by investing his uncle duke guelf the sixth with tuscany and sardinia in fact with the entire inheritance of the countess matilda who as is well known had bequeathed it to gregory the seventh and his successors for ever the pope's right thereto having been formally acknowledged by the emperor lothar when however frederick began to levy tribute on other possessions of the church and did so under pretence of his imperial prerogatives in rome when from these temporal he passed to spiritual usurpations and intruded firstly his chancellor reynold into the vacancy of cologne contrary to the provisions of the treaty of worms to which he was sworn and secondly his favourite guido of blandrate into the see of ravenna in direct opposition to the pope's wishes to whose episcopal jurisdiction guido as subdeacon in the roman church was exclusively subject and by whom he was destined for other and more suitable preferment then at last adrian's indignation could contain itself no longer and he addressed to the emperor a brief in which under a forced calmness and moderation of style his soreness at the outrages committed against him is yet plainly perceptible this brief was carried to the emperor by a messenger of inferior rank who moreover did not wait for an answer but disappeared as soon as he had delivered it this is asserted by some to have been meant as an insult to frederick who at any rate took care to view it as such adrian however was surely of too lofty a character to descend to such a petty act of spleen and it is far more likely that the messenger aware of what sort of letter he was carrying and to what sort of person did not care under the circumstances to do more than his bare errand but that done to save himself hastened from the very possible consequences to his poor limbs of the first ebullitions of the imperial wrath be that as it may frederick determined to let the pope see that he too could act as meanly and spitefully as it was pretended his holiness had acted and accordingly he gave his secretary orders to set in his reply the name of the emperor before that of the pope who at the same time was to be addressed in the second person singular contrary to etiquette which even in that age required the plural number to be used towards persons of high rank to this insolence of frederick adrian rejoined shortly and pithily rating him for his irreverence to the holy see and to st peter demonstrating to him how his present conduct belied his former oaths and warning him lest in seizing that which had not been given to him he should lose that which had frederick conscious of the grave nature of his crimes against the holy see but so long as fortune favoured him obstinate in his pride and deaf to religious reproach retorted adrian's reproof more audaciously than ever the imperial bully now bid the pope in plain terms stick to those things which as he said christ was the first to perform and teach the law of justice said he has restored to every one his own and he frederick will not fail to pay the full honour due to his predecessors by preserving intact the dignity and crown which they had transmitted to him 
why he was not to require feudal oaths and service from bishops who professed to belong simply to god is all the more incomprehensible to him as christ the great teacher of all men freely paid taxes to caesar for himself and peter by so doing proceeds frederick he gave thee adrian an example to follow and a lesson of the last importance in those words learn of me for i am meek and humble of heart from this sacrilegious irony he passes to vulgar abuse and tells the pope that his legates had been turned out of germany because they were not preachers but thieves not lovers of peace but heapers of money not reformers of the world but insatiate seekers of gold did pope sylvester he asked possess any temporal lordship in constantine's time and did not the popes afterwards owe all their temporal power to the generosity of that prince and the rest of frederick's predecessors in conclusion he remarks that it was because he saw the monster pride seated even in the chair of peter that he felt moved to use the language he did this letter was well calculated to provoke adrian's deepest indignation but as he never allowed his passions to get the better of his judgment and always knew how to curb the liveliest movements of personal wrath when the interests of the church were at stake heartily tired moreover of the petty rubs on which the dispute between him and frederick was by the latter ostensibly made to hinge he bestirred himself once more to effect a reconciliation compatible with his duty and character to this end he sent an embassy of a more stately description than had ever represented a pope before composed of five cardinals one of whom was a personal friend of frederick to the emperor at bologna whither he had arrived soon after easter a d eleven fifty nine to pass sentence on the milanese who in the meantime had again sought to shake off the german yoke the terms which this embassy was instructed to demand as fair and equitable were as follows that for the future no imperial agent should exercise pretended imperial prerogatives in rome without the foreknowledge of the pope that no levies on the domains of the church except when he was crowned that the italian bishops should not take oaths of particular but only of general homage that the possessions of the roman church and the revenues of ferrara massa veronola of the matilda inheritance of the country between aquapadenta and rome of spoleto sardinia and corsica all acknowledged in the middle ages as indisputable fiefs of the holy see should be restored at first the emperor haughtily refused to grant these conditions then on further reflection offered to abide by the decision of a committee of arbitration to consist of six cardinals chosen by the pope and six bishops chosen by himself but adrian as frederick foresaw and reckoned upon at once rejected this offer as derogatory to the dignity of a supreme pontiff which regarded by christendom as superior to every temporal jurisdiction could not therefore bow to one at the same time he reminded the emperor of his concordat with pope eugenius and called on him to stand to it frederick rejoined that he considered himself exonerated from it as adrian had been the first to break it by his treaty of peace with the king of sicily that this charge was a false one has already been shown the emperor persisted in his proposition for a committee of arbitration as both parties continued inflexible all prospect of a reconciliation vanished indeed measures of a hostile character seemed on the point of being resorted to on both sides for while frederick gave audience to a republican embassy from rome and appeared to listen favourably to the overtures made adrian openly exhorted the lombards to persevere in their resistance to the emperor and formed fresh relations with the king of sicily he also addressed a brief to the archbishops of mainz cologne and trives in which he gives his feelings full vent and asserts the superiority of his dignity over the emperor's in the true spirit of the hierarchy of that age praised be god in the highest writes he that ye remain faithful while the flies of pharaoh sprung from the abyss of hell and driven about by the whirlwind are turned to dust instead of darkening the sun according to their wish 
thanks be to god who doubtless hath enabled you to perceive that betwixt us and the king there can be no more fellowship this schism caused by him will yet rebound upon his head yes he is like the dragon that would needs fly through the midst of heaven and draw after him by his tail the third part of the stars but toppled into the abyss and left to his successors nothing but the warning that he who exalts himself will be humbled thus does this fox who is your hammer too think to lay waste the lord's vineyard thus does this wicked son forget all gratitude and godly fear not one of his promises has he kept everywhere has he deceived us and deserves therefore our ban as a rebel against god and as a true heathen and not only he but also we say it for your warning every one who seconds him yea every one who either in word or thought agrees with him he sets up his power as equal to ours as though this last were confined to a mere corner like germany to germany which till the popes exalted it passed only for the smallest of states did not the german kings travel about in an oxen-drawn chariot like any poor philosopher till pope zacharias consecrated charles do they not still hold their court in a forest at aix whereas we reside at rome even as rome is above aix so are we above that king who boasts of his world-wide sway while he can hardly keep in check one of his refractory princes or even subdue the rude and foolish race of the frieslanders in short he possesses the empire through us and that which we gave him on the supposition of gratitude alone we can resume do ye admonish him after this manner and reclaim him to the right path to peace with us for it will plunge you also into ruin if there be schism between church and state it may easily be supposed that words like these would be ill calculated to arrest frederick's unprincipled career nor of course did adrian expect they would he rather acted now under the persuasion that conciliation had reached its limits inasmuch as further concessions would dishonour his dignity and be a dereliction of his duty as chief pastor of the christian church the unconditional subjection of which under the brutal sway of the civil sword frederick plainly proved that it was his great aim to effect adrian therefore resolved now that every advance and self-sacrifice on his side consistent with reason and justice had been made in vain to arm himself with those thunders which the arm of a pope only can launch and which the feelings of christendom rendered so dreadful even to the most potent and hardened offenders to this course he was impelled all the more as frederick in further proof of his contempt of the most sacred obligations when they stood in the way of his ambition shortly added to his crimes against the church another against public morals by wantonly repudiating out of motives of state policy his lawful empress to marry in her stead beatrix of burgundy any remnants of hesitation to adopt extreme measures which adrian might still cherish were completely eradicated in his mind by this crying scandal and he at once prepared a ban of excommunication against the emperor but in the moment of fulminating it death paralyzed his arm this happened september first eleven fifty nine near anangia in the campagna and according to william of tyre in consequence of a quinsy Paggi relates that the partisan of frederick told a story to this effect that pope adrian died by a judgment of god who permitted him while drinking at a well a few days after denouncing excommunication against the emperor to swallow a fly which stuck in his throat and could not be extracted by the surgeons till the patient had expired through the inflammation produced by the accident adrian however did not excommunicate the emperor at all but died on the eve of doing so his body was carried to rome and entombed in a costly sarcophagus of marble beside that of eugenius the third in the nave of the old basilica of st peter in the year sixteen o seven on the demolition of this church the body was exhumed and found entire as well as the pontificals in which it was arrayed 
it was reinterred under the pavement of the new basilica according to pagi pope adrian the fourth composed catechisms of christian doctrine for the swedes and norwegians a memoir of his mission to those nations de legazione sua various homilies and a treatise on the conception of the blessed virgin performances which appear to have perished the work describing his mission to the north must have been of great interest for the light which it no doubt threw on the history and manners of those countries Münter, the church historian of denmark mentions that he sought to discover it at rome but without success it being supposed if still extant to lie buried beneath the impractical hordes of the vatican cardinal bozo an englishman and pope adrian's private secretary whom he sent out on a mission to portugal wrote a life of his patron but so invaluable a work is also unavailable as no trace of it now exists from an anecdote preserved in william of newbridge adrian the fourth would seem to have pushed integrity in money matters to a harsh extreme and so to have proved himself the antipodes of those popes who afterwards practised nepotism for it is related of him that rather than award a pittance towards the relief of his aged and destitute mother out of those ample revenues which as pope he had at his disposal but which he did not feel himself justified in diverting to private uses he allowed her to subsist as best she could on the alms of the chapter of canterbury notwithstanding the incessant conflicts of his short career he yet found time to do something towards the improvement and decoration of rome to this end he projected and carried out various new buildings and restorations consisting in churches within and without the city in castles for the protection of the campagna and in additions to the lateran palace the duration of his pontificate comprised four years and eight months End of chapter 9. End of Pope Adrian the Fourth, an historical sketch by Richard Raby.